The human body helps you fly formation. It, it was doing automatically, uh, making a whole bunch of corrections that I didn't really have to think about. It's like I could uh, fly formation and eat lunch at the same time because of, of automatic reactions within my body. So I had applied to the Navy uh, after college and the Air Force, and the Navy turned me down for uh, high blood pressure, and the Air Force uh, accepted me, and, and, but I, I couldn't get into a class for about six months, so I came back here to Visalia and bided my time when I got a draft notice from the Army. So they said I had to do something in a hell of a hurry, and I enlisted in the uh, Air Force to keep from going into the Army. I was commissioned in 1963, and the Vietnam War was uh, just starting to build up at that point. And uh, uh, I went to pilot training at uh, Enid Air Force Base in Oklahoma, and then fighter training in Arizona, and off to Europe for three years, where I flew the F-100. The war is, is now cranking up in Southeast Asia, and I was transferred uh, from England all the way over to Vietnam. My one-year tour was just winding up when uh, two former Thunderbirds, Tony McPeak and Jack Dickey, happened to come to Tuiwa, my base, and they uh, uh, encouraged me to apply for the Thunderbirds, which I did. It was the most briefest application you ever saw in your life because uh, of the facilities that I had to produce. A decent application in the, in, in the war zone were, were somewhat limited. At that point, um, uh, the numbers are slimmed down to four or five finalists who are invited to come out to uh, Nellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas, which is home of the Thunderbirds, and then go through another interview process and now also a formal flying process where, where you get in the, in the F-4 and, and go do loops and rolls and things for 45 minutes. Uh, quite a very, very trying uh, flight scenario. I had not flown the F-4. I was completely foreign to the airplane, but uh, an airplane's an airplane and, uh, and you strap it on and you do the best you know how and, and your training takes place. And uh, from that point, uh, uh, selections are made and I was uh, fortunate to be selected. Uh, my training started off with uh, two airplanes, the leader and me on the wing with, uh, with uh, an experienced Thunderbird in my back seat, and then you just build uh, day by day, two or three flights a day, starting in, uh, in December, uh, a little bit of time off for Christmas, and then January and February, the training season, lots and lots of repetitious flying training. During my two years on the team, uh, I was just a single solo. I longed to have a second solo to be able to fly with me, but uh, two years before I got on the team, uh, the team was flying F-100s, and in the training season, right towards the end of the training season, the two solo pilots uh, had a mid-air collision. One of them was killed, and the other one was, uh, was removed from the team. That was a major juncture junction in the Air Force for, uh, for the team. They were wanting to transition into the F-4 and the general officers in charge uh, elected to go ahead at that point to stop the training season, transition into F-4, and, uh, and then get on with the, with the F-4 air show. The um, decision was also made to just have a single solo at that point in that first year of transition and then uh, if all was well in the future that they would uh, would transition back to uh, the dual solo. When all the smoke is cleared my job was made very very much easier being a single solo because I didn't have to worry about my timing uh, involving the, the other solo airplane and and it was uh, just a heck of a lot of fun. Uh, if I had it to do uh, all over again and choose my which number I could fly, I would be right there at number five again. We interfaced with the Blue Angels throughout my two years on the team here and there, not very much, but we invited them to come up to our end of, uh, end of year uh, show and our reunion. There was some, some uh, 
anxiety there because of the competition and whether the Thunderbirds would try and do better uh, than the Blue Angels or the Blue Angels would try and do better than the Thunderbirds. But uh, as far as, as, as I go personally, they are, needn't worry about trying to do better because the show is, is structured, it's very difficult, you need to be totally engrossed in the show, you don't see or hear or, or uh, are aware of anything else that's going on the outside. Uh, I felt like I personally had to, because the Blue Angels had the dual solo and I was by myself, that I had to be on mark on all of my maneuvers. So I was just focused on, on just flying the very, very best show that I, that I could. It was the last uh, show of a, of a week-long process. It was a Sunday show. The crowd was massive. The weather was delightful. And uh, in the startup, uh, number three pilot, Joe Howard's airplane was malfunctioning, so he got out of his airplane and jumped into a spare aircraft, delaying us a little bit. So the, we went through the show process, and about two-thirds of the way through the show, we had just finished a uh, five-ship wedge roll. And we just finished the roll, and we're just pulling it back up here, nose above the horizon, and started to climb about 425 knots, something like that, when an airplane departed the formation. I was outside left, and somebody on the right side had departed, and I thought it was the lead airplane. It just left so fast. And it was a number three airplane, Joe Howard's airplane, uh, just pulled between the engineers, figure between 15 and 17 Gs going straight up uncontrolled. And uh, at that point, we got a radio call from Joe that I'm bailing out. And then we got a radio control from Tim Rolls on the ground that Joe got a good shoot. But unfortunately, he was too close to the fireball which uh, melted the nylon in his, in his chute and, and, he, and he fell to his death. Uh, in the investigation of the accident, they found out that the uh, hydraulic control arm that controls the horizontal tail, which gives you up and down motion of the airplane, nose up, nose down, had failed and separated and made the horizontal stabilizer freewheeling, which it went to bam, immediately to the full nose up position, and that's why he part of the uh, formation so fast. We were within probably two or three rides of finishing training with Kirk Brimmer when uh, uh, we landed uh, and I was met by um, Commander Leader Tom Swam and said, Steve, you've just had your last flight. And I was uh, a little bit puzzled by that. And as it turns out, Jerry Bolt, the slot pilot, had been uh, taken uh, a replacement airplane uh, to be used during the training season. It was just a fleet airplane brought in, and he was in a shakedown flight out in the desert, in the desert and uh, crashed and, and was killed. And uh, uh, Jerry Bolt and Joe Howard and I came on the team together two years previous, and I was the only one left, so he said, that that's it. Year down. But basically, Kirk Bremer was, was all trained for all intents and purposes, and so that was my Saudi flight. The camaraderie is very, very strong, and it's unfortunate that I lost the two guys that I joined the team with, but in the process of being on the road 270 days a year with a, with a small group of people, you become very, very close-knit. And uh, the group of Thunderbirds are uh, no doubt my absolute strongest uh, social contacts. We get together uh, with a number of different members throughout the year, and then of course every two years we get together in Las Vegas and have a, have a big reunion. But it was a tremendous honor uh, for me to to be selected on the team and represent the uh, Air Force throughout the world, and I, uh, I would do it again in a heartbeat.